the ministry of freedom. Okay. Luke 4, 18, where he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. And from this passage, we have anointing. Last Sunday, we talked about it and preached about the anointing. And then he said that he sent him to heal. So that's our subject today. In the book of Exodus, well, first of all, let me say this. Going back to last Sunday and today, our participation in communion It said that Jesus, when he stood up in the temple and he read from Isaiah, he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing through me bodily. And he said that that anointing, and I never got to this point last Sunday, but the anointing, the anointing does a lot of things as we talked about. The anointing is the divine influence of the spirit upon an individual to do things that they would not ordinarily want to do or have the capabilities to do, the anointing. And it said that the anointing is transferable, that it will destroy the yoke. The fact that it brought up a yoke was togetherness and connection. That the anointing can be transferred, but when the anointing is transferred from one individual to another, from the Holy Spirit to you, from God to you, whatever, however that transfer takes place, it breaks that yoke that has you bound. That's another power of the anointing. People get up and sing, get up and preach, get up and say things and do things under the unction or the enablement because of the anointing. But it said he anointed me, he gave me a special ability to change some things, in other words, because the anointing changes. The lady broke the alabaster box and it changed the atmosphere. You could smell the aroma of that perfume. When you got around her, you could tell she'd been with Jesus. When you got around Jesus, you could tell he had been with her. The anointing, communion, relationship. So, but he said, and this is a point that I didn't really discuss last Sunday, was that he said he came to preach the gospel to the poor. The word poor right there in the King James Version means spiritually destitute. From the Strong's original definition of that word, that word, not in the English, not in Webster's, in the definition where the Bible translations come from, it means spiritually destitute, or it means deeply destitute. It means completely lacking resources, even earthly. It means helpless as a beggar. And it relates to the pauper rather than the mere peasant. It's the lowest of low. It's the extreme opposite of the rich. Came to preach the gospel to the poor. That was me. That was you. Because, you know, as far as freedom, I'm talking about the ministry of freedom. And when you're looking at our natural freedom in this world here, in America, there are some people that because we're born into America, we're born into freedom. But there's some people that are not, are, that are not born free. You can be born into freedom because you're a citizen of the United States of America. But every person... was born in sin when we were born. 
Not that we sinned, we were born in the state of sin, the condition of sin. We were stripped. We were all barren. And we had to be born in to freedom. And that comes through the gospel. First Corinthians says that the gospel, he said, this is the gospel that I declare unto you. That Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. That's the gospel. So, oh God, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. So I thank God so much today that he came and he shed his blood and gave his body for us who were spiritually destitute in a condition that we could not improve. We couldn't improve upon our spiritual destitution. Only he could. Aren't you thankful today that he came and set us free? Would you give him a hand of appreciation right now? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, to quickly get through this text, which I have read to you today, they complained, he cried out unto the Lord. But they traveled into a wilderness, and they murmured against Moses in that wilderness. You know why they murmured against Moses? Because when you get into a wilderness, what is in you will come out. <laughs> it comes out. It starts showing. When you're going through hardships, when you're going through a hard time, when you're struggling, you're in a dry place spiritually, some things will start surfacing and things will start coming out. And so, as they traveled, they came to this. Now, I want you to notice something. First of all, let's go back to the beginning of the text. When Miriam and all of them were dancing and they were praising the Lord. It's all biblical. Praising the Lord, dancing, shouting, lifting up even a loud voice unto the Lord. It's all biblical. But have you ever been, see what happened after they, after they had the good shout? They had a good service. They had a good move of God and the presence of the Lord was manifest and came down to the point that they just physically felt it. Amen. And they danced and they shouted and they praised the Lord. But what happens after a good shout? When you go home the next day, <laughs> testing starts. Sometimes testing starts. Sometimes the enemy hits you wide open after a big, good shout. But that's because you've done a lot of good when you're praising and worshiping God. Angels are being released and things are happening in the spiritual realm. You're binding and loosing. You're, you're doing a lot of things. You're binding and ha that's spiritual warfare when you're praising and worshiping the Lord. Anyway, and the Bible said that God brought them to this mara, the place where the water was bitter, to test them, prove them. So that was right after a great shout. Amen. Now the Lord's testing me. <laughs> Have you ever been in a position or in a condition where you had a problem, you had an issue, you had a, a prayer that you were praying, and you come to something that you think is the answer, only to find, oh, that's not the answer. Nothing is more disappointing than think you have arrived than for you to think you have arrived at the place where God's answering your prayer, only to find out that there's more to this than what you thought. Amen. That's what happened. They were without water. They were in a dry place in the wilderness, and they came to the water because they had been three days without water, and they were thirsty. And they already asked him, "What are we going to drink?" And they came to the water, but the water was bitter. The water was bitter. Oh, my Lord. We can, and they stopped right there. They camped right here. Have you ever been bitter? Just be honest with me. Have you ever been bitter? Has anybody over here ever been bitter? Anybody over here? What about over here? Has anyone ever been bitter? It's not easy to get out of it, is it? Things happen in life, especially when you're a child of God, 
that's connected to him and the church and spiritual realms and things. And things happen sometimes because this is, this is never supposed to be about any individual. It's not supposed to be about me. I only have my place in the kingdom. But you have your place in the kingdom as well. And sometimes God do, does some things that we don't necessarily agree with or like, but he does it anyway because he's God. He's sovereign. And then, you know, marriage. Oh, pastor, we had communion. Don't get the meddling this morning. <laughs> Woo, we are holy this morning. <laughs> Let's see what time it is. Ooh, ha, ha, da, 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 da. Yeah. Marriage can make you bitter. Yeah. Or better. It can make you better too. I guess there's any circumstance in life can bring bitterness or it can bring you to a better place. It's all how you look at it. It's all how you allow it to affect you. It's all about how you handle it. It's all about how you approach it. So you can be bitter spiritually about things that God has done that you don't like. I went through a phase when the Lord took my dad and he was my best friend and I've already lived several years longer than my dad was able to live and he was a good man and he was a strong rock in my life and the Lord chose to took him, take him at 46 years of age and I actually got angry at God about it. My youngest brother was only, I think, uh, 10 at the time. And I had, to, I had to pray my way through. You can't just sit there and camp at Mara. Are you hearing me this morning? Mara was bitter. That's bitter. That was never intended the place where God wanted them to camp. We're going to see where he wanted us to camp, them to camp as we read further in this text. But if you stop at bitter... Bitter is about the worst situation that could come into, into any individual's life. It'll mess everything up in your life. So I want to stop right here and I want us to make sure this morning that we don't have any little nagging, daunting things that keep trying to come into our lives or anything big, aggressive, and formidable right in front of us, staring us right in our face Daring us to be bitter because that's not the will of God. Because as we move on in this text, we find that there was a tree. Man, I keep feeling a wave of the Holy Spirit this morning. I know I'm right on track here today. There was a tree. Now they're in a desert. They're in a wilderness. And there's a tree. Think about this. Here they are. God knew way beforehand that they were going to come there, that they were going to arrive at that place, that the water was going to be bitter, and that he was, going, he was doing it to test them. And so I don't know how it happened, but somewhere, trees don't grow overnight. Even the, the anomaly that one's in the desert, okay, let's say it was by water, all right, that makes sense, but still. God planted a tree a long time ago to be there when they needed it. What I'm saying is this. God planted a tree for your life before the doctor ever gave, ever gave you the report. God planted a, a, an answer to your situation a long time before you got in that situation. He has prepared an answer. Every time God sets up something in your life for you to struggle with and go through, there is a date of your exit. There is an appointed time for you to come out of it. Don't give 
up at Mara. You hear me? God prepared an answer. God has a prepared answer for you today. I don't know what you are going through. I don't know what the struggle of your life is right now, but I just feel like stopping right here for a moment and telling you, God's got an answer for you. I'm telling you in the Holy Spirit, God's got an answer for you. He has prepared an answer for you. You can get ready. Something is about to happen. You can get ready. A breakthrough is coming. You can get ready. Victory is on its way. God has prepared an answer for you. Woo! Hallelujah! Woo! It may feel like it's a long time coming. John 5, 1 through 8 tells us about a man that sat by a pool in Bethesda in John 5. And at a certain time of the year, an angel would come and he would touch and trouble the water. And the first one that got in the water was healed. And this man had tried numerous times to get in there, but the timing was always right. Amen. For 38 years, he struggled. You hear me? 38 years. That's a long time. And sometimes as you're praying for the answer, you're stepping it out. You're walking it out. I wish it would have happened back there, but I'm continuing in this thing. It keeps happening. I'm believing God by faith, but I get up in the morning and it's still there. I'm preaching to you this morning. God's preparing an answer for you. Don't give up. Jesus himself is going to come by one day and he's going to say, will thou be made whole? You know what I appreciate about that man that was by that pool? He was an impotent man, and the impotent man met the omnipotent man. But you know what I like about that man? He didn't give up. That's why Jesus came to him. He kept his faith. He kept believing. He kept trying for 38 years. I don't know if he'd been trying for all that amount of time, but I just know that that disease, and I know that for many years he'd been trying to get, he didn't give up. Hey, I'm preaching to you today that your physical condition might be a condition that's been around for a long time. And you might feel like in the practical, every day that you get up, you got to walk through it. But I'm going to tell you, if you'll keep your faith this morning, God is a miracle worker. And he said, he is the God that healeth thee. In Exodus chapter 15, which I read for, to, a te- for you, for, to you for a text, when the Lord st- specifically made that declaration I am the Lord that healeth thee it was the first time it had ever happened it's the first time that God had ever made that declaration I am the Lord that heals thee and then we can trace miracle after miracle after miracle it, it's not the first time that God healed I'm not saying that I don't, I don't know that that's true I'm just saying it's the first time that God himself made the declaration I am the God that healeth thee listen that's all I need That's all I need. Just for God to say, I am the Lord that healeth thee. If you will do right and you will listen to my voice when I talk to you and try to keep my commandments, none of these diseases have to come on you and they have to stay. They don't have to. But if you you camp out at Mara, if you camp out at bitterness, you're going to miss Blessing. Are you familiar with the term Jehovah Rapha? Yeah. The Lord, our healer. Can you say it with me? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. Let me read this to you, something that I read in a devotional the other day. And it's not that we who have faith need this, but I feel like this is encouraging It says, gone are the days when gun-shy theologians bowed to the God of science. Reliable scientists are now affirming how ingenious God is and how his principles hold up under the piercing light of scientific scrutiny. Neuroscientist Andrew Newberg, M.D., 
who studies the relationship between spiritual phenomena and the brain, has demonstrated that we were designed physically and mentally to interact with God through prayer and scripture. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? It connects with our brain. It's a known fact now that there are centers in the human brain that respond positively to prayer, reading and meditating on God's word, group worship, hymn singing, and empathy for other people. And Dr. Newberg believes that practicing a personal religious faith is the most powerful way to maintain a healthy brain. You hear that? The brain's frontal lobe is used in focusing attention, rational thinking, and decision making. It responds to prayer and meditation by helping to reduce stress, strengthen our immune system, enhance memory, and increase our capacity for compassion. It helps us ward off age-related brain deterioration and live longer. Newberg's research indicates that praying for at least 12 minutes a day slows age-related brain decline. Prayer and reading scripture also deactivates area in the brain associated with anger, guilt, anxiety, depression, fear, resentment, and pessimism. It seems that finally 21st century science has joined ancient scripture in echoing what the psalmist said. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, Psalm 139. Can you think of a better way, according to Colossians 3.16, to let the word of God dwell in you richly? Thank God for it. He is our healer this morning. Isaiah 53 says, you can put it on if you want. Isaiah 53, 5, I'm closing with these two scriptures. Isaiah 53 says, in verse 5, that with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes. You understand what that means? That means at that moment, in that present moment, in the past, as the stripes were being applied to Jesus' back, with those stripes, we are healed. Just as soon and as immediate as the stripes were applied, that's when we get our healing. Then already been done and then first peter 2 verse 24 says it like this it says by whose stripes ye were healed by whose stripes we were healed with his stripes and by his stripes ye were healed Already done. Those two scriptures tell us that back then when the stripes were applied, the healing's already been paid for. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken hearted. So today, the healing that God wants to do as I close, yes, it's physical, but it's not just physical. He wants the healing that is complete. James 5 states that when you call for the elders of the church and they anoint you with oil and pray the prayer of faith. By the way, it's the prayer of faith that does it. It's not necessarily the elders or the anointing with oil. It's the prayer of faith that does it. Anyone can pray. the If you can pray the prayer of faith. Sometimes you need some help, so you call for the elders, anoint you with oil, pray the prayer of faith over you. And it goes on, it said you will be healed, but also afflictions. And then it goes on to say, the afflictions have to do with mentally and spiritually. Because it goes on to say 
that your sins would be forgiven you. So the healing that God wants to do in our life is not just physically, although it is. It's also emotionally and mentally and spiritually and emotionally. So pass the test this morning. Isaiah 61 verse 8 says, For your shame you shall have double. For your shame you shall have double. I feel like the Lord's saying you might have been going through some things. There might have been some struggles. There might have been some trouble. There might have been some issues. There might have been some hurts. Broken hearted there means crushed, totally broken. So the healing is physically, mentally, spiritually and emotionally for your shame you should have double and so when he put the tree in the water and the water turned sweet and they packed their camps and they moved on if you read the passage further you find that where God really wanted them to camp was called Elam not Mara, Elam and it had 12 wells and 70 palm trees. That's really the destination that God had in mind. That's where God was trying to take them. And that's where God wants to take us. Can we stand this morning? Can you just bow your head as they begin to play or sing or whatever they feel impressed in the spirit today? And let's just... Will you allow the Holy Spirit to just bring healing into you? Come on, will you let your mind just really get on Jesus right now and let healing, let healing flow, let it come over you this morning. Go. You should be free this morning. Over the hill. And everywhere Come on, go Go tell Tell it on on the mountain mountain That Jesus Christ Christ is born Come on, it's that season, I thank God Go tell it on the The mountain mountain. Come on, you are healed in the name of Jesus I speak healing to you if you need to come up here for us to pray for you, this altar, this, this whole area is open this morning. This whole front is open right now. Woo! Go tell it.